Hello YouTube, this is Captain Ball again, and in this video I would like to continue the experiments with the original flintlock military rifle and the flintlock military musket. I would like to compare the practical accuracy and their ballistics, their trajectory as well. On my channel you can find several videos about this topic, but this will be a bit different. This is a kind of experimental archaeology project, so I have my principles for the shooting test. First, I'm going to fire and load the guns according to the original 19th century manuals. These are Habsburg guns, so I'm going to use the Habsburg manuals. Second, I'm going to load these guns with the same charge as it was used back in the 19th century, same bullet size, bullet weight, and I'm going to try to replicate the powder charge as well, which is quite easy in the case of the musket, because I know the muzzle velocity, we know the muzzle velocity, and it's a bit harder in the case of the rifle, where we do not have information about the muzzle velocity. Third, I'm going to wear full uniform. I will be very nice, very elegant. For the infantry musket, the Austrian 1798 infantry musket, I'm going to wear the uniform of the 1805 war against Napoleon, so this is the Battle of Austerlitz time. And for the Jägerstützen, I'm going to use the Jäger uniform of the Hungarian Jägers in the revolution against the Habsburg Empire in 1848-49. This is, although a different conflict, the accoutrements, loading method and the rifles are the same, so these things match together well. Probably from all these aspects, the most important one is recreating the muzzle velocity. For recreating the muzzle velocity, first you have to have the original bullet, as I told you, same diameter, exactly the same diameter, exactly the same weight, and exactly the same cartridge construction. These are very important ones. We all know this because this, these are included in the manuals. But second, we have to know the muzzle velocity. And that's a very important thing. And for the musket we have a better picture, because we have 19th century sources describing the muzzle velocity of the musket ball. They had the ballistic pendulum by that time, and they measured it, they wrote it down, we have that. We know that the muzzle velocity of a musket ball was somewhere between 450 meters per second and 500 meters per second. This was the average for the French caliber muskets by the uh, first decades of the, of the 19th century, during the Napoleonic Wars. But we don't have that kind of information for the rifles. So we are going to have a clear picture for the musket and we are going to have a less accurate picture for the rifle. We have to live with that. Let's talk about the musket first. We know that the 17.5 mm caliber musket bores were loaded with a 15.9 mm lead round ball weighing 24 grams. And I also know that to reach the 500 meters per second muzzle velocity, you have to charge the bore with 10 grams of 1.5 F Swiss powder. I added one more gram for priming the pen, which means that the cartridges are loaded with 11 grams of 1.5 F Swiss powder. This is the musket. Determinating the charge of the rifle cartridge was a much more delicate question. We know that the original Jäger Stutzen cartridge held one quintel of Scheibenpulver. It was a finer powder than the musket powder. One quintel equals 4.3 grams, so which means we have an information here. But we do not know the real difference between the coarse musket powder and the finer rifle powder. So what I did, I stepped back one on the corn side, which means that if I loaded the musket with the 1.5 F powder, I loaded the rifle with 2 F powder. The charge was then 4.3 grams of 2 F Swiss powder. On the other hand, we are in much better position with the bullet, because we exactly know that it was 14.1 millimeter diameter, and you also know the weight, we can calculate the weight from that. And we also know that the caliber of the bore of the 1807 Jäger was 13.9 mm. So this is kind of strange. So you have a smaller caliber bore than the bullet itself, and you also add the patch there. Which means that you really had to hammer that bullet into the bore, because the 13.9 mm bore was loaded with a 14.1 mm bullet. This is the forcing principle. We do not know the exact thickness of the patch. We know that it was triangular, we know the shape and we know the size, but we don't know the thickness of the material that can affect the gas pressure, the accuracy also, and it can affect, of course, the muzzle velocity. So what I did, I used 0.31 millimeter thick uh, linen patch. Why? Because I think that's okay, but <laughs> that's, that's, that's something we really do not know. The result of, this, result of this combination was 400 meters per second of muzzle velocity. So 
I'm pretty sure that it could be somewhere here, probably a bit less, probably a bit more, but 400 meters per second is, is, I think it's okay. So this is not accurate, but very close to the original muzzle velocity. We are searching for practical accuracy, which means that we cannot fire the guns to 25 meters from a rest to determine it, which is the better. We have to find and we have to try the guns at common average tactical musket distances. What I'm going to simulate is the skirmishing situation when the enemy soldier is a single soldier and I have to take an aim shot on him. I'm not going to fire on closed formations, closed ranks, so this is a skirmishing situation. The distances I used are 75 meters or 100 paces for the first distance and the second distance will be 150 paces or 112 meters. Let's start with 75 meters first. My original 1798 Austrian musket is not fit for high pressure charges, so I used my pedestal repro for the test. Although repro, a smoothbore 17.5mm bore is easy to replicate, so this does not affect the accuracy of the test. The loading sequence of the musket is based on the general instructions by Franz Moritz Lassi, first published in 1796. Quiet old reglement in the age of the Napoleonic Wars, it needed some important updates when the 1798 musket entered service. The previous musket did not need priming the pen, as it had a self-priming breech. The new 1798 musket's process had to be started with pouring the priming powder in the pen. Quite important change that was not written in manuals until 1806-7. I wonder what confusion it caused. A good soldier was expected to load and fire his musket three times a minute, but I'm a bit slower than that. For me, circa two shots per minute is already a challenge. I also lose some time with turning the ramrod after I drew it from the channel. The Austrian muskets had a cylindrical ramrod that had a rammer on both ends, making it unnecessary to turn for pushing down the charge. Aiming with the musket is not easy, as we do not have a rear sight here, just a brass front sight near the muzzle. The only smoothbore musket of the Austrian army with rear sights was the model 1809 Jaeger carbine, a shortened musket for the first two ranks of the light troops. They were the carabiner Jaegers. In each Feldjäger battalion, two thirds of the soldiers were fighting with smoothbores with rear sight, and only one third with rifles. Well, the recoil is hefty, the recoil is strong, and it's, sometimes it's not easy to manage the cartridge to get properly into the bore, but it's fun, it's definitely a great fun. So ladies and gentlemen, this is the 75 meter on the hundred or 100 paces target, all the five shots in the target, which means that two are literally wounding the soldier. Also, the ones surrounding the body are also hitting somebody on the line, probably, or uh, in the next row, which technically means that the rifle is tactically accurate at this distance. Of course, it's not a tight group, it's not a rifle that we'll, we would use for hunting, but from the tactical point of view, probably at 75 meters for skirmishing, it is also enough, but I would go for a rifle at this distance. 
The musket needed an average is 37 seconds to load and fire, but if I remove the time spent with fixing the first barrel band, we arrive to circa 30 seconds. The group of the musket at 75 meters could be covered with a 38.6 by 64.9 cm rectangle. Although I could always hit the 80 by 80 cm target, actually only two impacts were in the body. Frankly speaking, I would say that the musket is unfit to fight a single enemy soldier, even at this distance. The rifle is my original model 1807 Jägerstützen rifle. This beauty is in mint condition and was reproofed for safe firing. The Jägers had two options for loading their rifles. First with using a powder measure and patch balls, second with the powder charge rolled into paper cartridge with separate patch and ball. I'm going to use the powder measure method, used for accurate fire. They had their tricks for increasing the speed of loading, such was placing the patches under the cord of the head for easy access. Another method is associated with the construction of the rifle. These firearms never had a channel for the ramrod in the stock. The loading rod was attached to the strap of the cartridge box with a leather sling. It was faster and easier to handle the ramrod this way. Priming the pen was not the last but the first stage of loading. The pen was not primed from the cartridge, but the powder horn, securing that each powder charge weighted the same. I needed approximately 60 seconds for loading and firing the rifle, so my rate of fire was therefore half as in the case of the musket. The Austrian Jaegers did not have a dedicated manual during the French wars. The best source for learning the proper procedure is Sigimundus Pamgarten's book titled Abhandlung über den Dienst der Feldjäger zu Fuß, published in Vienna in 1802. The most time-consuming part of the process was starting the patched oversized ball in the muzzle. It needed the use of the wooden mallet attached to the side of the cartridge box and the starter as well.
let's check it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a 75 meter or 100 paces distance for the Jägerstützen and you can see that all the shots are within the body, which means that this rifle is perfectly fitting for skirmishing at this distance. It's out of question that it is more accurate than the musket. Let's check the longer distance. As an average, I could load and fire the gun in 62 seconds, meaning that one shot per minute is the rate of fire. The 5 shot group of the rifle at 75 meters could be covered with a 12.5 by 15.9 cm rectangle with all shots in the target and all shots in the body, 12 times smaller area than the musket's group. Well, we can state that at 75 meters, both guns' tactical accuracy is enough for hitting a single soldier, which is good. Now let's move on to 150 paces. And that will be another 5 shots to 150 paces, or 112 meters. The 150 paces at 112 meters could be close to the distance where most of the volleys were fired. This is the distance where you recognize faces, or as it is commonly said, you see the white of the eye of the enemy. The loading of the musket did not get any harder. The ball itself is 1.6 mm smaller than the bore, so falling cannot slow the procedure. It's only 10 shots. Misfires could be caused by many reasons, like a blunt flint, a loosened jaw screw, fooling on the stone or frizzen, a clock touch hole. The soldiers had to be trained to cure all the problems in the line.
The ordinary foot soldier did not carry a horn for priming, so if the flash in the pan failed to ignite the main charge for some reason, repriming meant losing a cartridge. This could be a reason why archaeologists find so many drop balls on the battlefield. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this musket has a recoil that has a tremendous recoil. You don't really want to shoot it all day, for sure. And that's 150 paces, and as you can see, there are no hits in the body, which technically means that for skirmishing up against one single enemy soldier, this musket is inadequate at this distance already. I have two shots in the target, one there, one there, out of the five, but this technically means that this is absolutely not accurate, absolutely not accurate. Probably it would be good against, against uh, close battle formations, close fighting orders, but not against a single soldier. The impacts were widely scattered around the target, proving that the service load with the service musket was not designed to fire at a single enemy soldier at this distance. The soldier on skirmish duty had the option to load and fire his musket or rifle in any position to aid accuracy. The Jaegers are better trained in the art of firing prone, kneeling or sitting position, and in using covers as support, but for the sake of balanced comparison, I'm using the standing position. Fouling was not an issue in the case of the rifle, as a lubricated patch cleans the bore after each shot, and the tallow keeps the fooling soft.
and that's 150 paces and here also all the shots are within the body which means that up to this distance this rifle is perfect for skirmishing much better than the musket which had no hits in the body it is more accurate that was not a question so the bullet is oversized compared to the length-to-length -length diameter of the bore which means that we we can assume that it cuts the patches but in fact it's, it does not it was a very tight fit so the ball is oversized and also the patch material is very thick and still you don't see any damage on this it has a perfect seal and the accuracy is good as well of course it's very hard to load but the accuracy is good at 112 meters the rifle had all shots within a 36.5 by 26.7 centimeter rectangle well within the size of a human chest little more than the size of an a4 paper sheet this is proving that we did not arrive to the limits of the rifle fire. Now that was different, wasn't it? No hits with the musket in a practical accuracy situation. Well, that tells a lot about the capabilities of the rifle as well. Well, let's stop for a second to talk about the ballistics as well. Let's talk about the benefits of the flat trajectory. The need for a flat trajectory was not born in the 20th century. This is understandable as less the soldier had to learn about using the sights and aiming, the easier and shorter the training was. The outer edge of musketry fire was approximately 300 paces or 225 meters. Having the trajectory of the ball under the height of a man at this distance was an unreachable goal by these times. Firing the gun from the shoulder, the ball surely exited the 2 meter height, leaving a portion of the battlefield in front uncovered. I used the ballistic software to simulate the trajectory of the two guns. Let's check the trajectory of the musket first. If the soldier aimed at 225 meters, the trajectory exited the height of the man at 90 meters and re-entered at 160 meters, leaving 70 meters or 31% of the field uncovered. The ball reached its peak height above the line of sight at 124 meters with 62.9 centimeter. The trajectory of the rifle was more curved. It exited the man height as early as 50 meters and re-entered only at 185 meters, leaving 60% of the field uncovered. It reached its peak at 122 meters with 84 centimeters. Although the musket covered double of the field as the rifle, I can hardly imagine that this had any benefits in tactics due to its poor accuracy. <laughs> So why the rifle was not able to replace the musket entirely in the first half of the 19th century? Well, we have strategical and tactical reasons for this. Let's start with the tactical reasons. Most of the military historians usually agree that the main problem was the slow loading procedure, but I doubt this, because in many countries' military manuals you find loading procedures for cartridges, paper cartridges with naked ball, for rifles. For example, the Harper's Ferry rifle, the US Harper's Ferry rifle, had that kind of instructions, loading with the ball without the patch. The same goes for the British Baker rifle. It had actually two kinds of cartridges, one with a patch included and one without the patch. The cartridges without the patch could be loaded just as fast as the musket cartridges, and they could be well used in skirmishing situations. The second and probably the more important reason was that these rifles are shorter. They are less fit for fighting against cavalry. Some of these rifles even never had a bayonet. For example, the US rifles, the 1792 rifle, the 1794 rifle, the Harper's Ferry rifles or the Mississippi rifle, they originally never had a bayonet lug, so they were not fit for close combat. Rifles were always more precisely made. They were delicate, more delicate items than the infantry musket, rendering them much more vulnerable in close combat situations. The strategic level of this question includes also three important factors. The first one is cost. The cost of a rifle was two or three times more than the cost of a musket. Second, they were also very slow to make, and you had to have a special expertise to pull the rifling into the bore. And three, you have to have a much better human resource than an average infantry soldier which was not common by those times. So the rate of fire was important, but probably the less important factor of all. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching. This is the Cap and Ball YouTube channel. If you like what I do, then please subscribe and also please give a thumb up to the video. If you wish and you can, you can support us through Patreon. You can find the link under this video, but you can also buy your authentic American Civil War paper cartridge boxes and also our percussion revolver paper cartridge formers. 
We offer these products in 31, 36 and 44 calibers, both in US and Confederate versions. They are fully family made by our own venture. You can find the link to the eBay store or to our webshop under this video as well. What more can I say? Until next time, stay cool and keep your powder dry.